Honorable Chief Minister of Karnataka, Sri Shadanand Gauraji, my distinguished colleague in the Council of Ministers, Dr. Birappa Moili, Sri Muniappa, President PCC, Dr. Parameshwar, Leader of the Congress Party in State Legislature, Siddhi Ramaya, other distinguished guests, the organizers of today's function, Sri Kumar Ji, Sri Ji, and other distinguished guests who have assembled here to pay their homage to K. Hunumantaya, a great son of India. Sri Hunumantaya became Chief Minister in 1952. Born in 1908, he assumed the office of the Chief Minister of the erstwhile Mysore State. Karnataka was yet to be formed after the State Reorganization Commission's report being implemented in 1956. But Mysore State itself was a big state. He became the Chief Minister at the age of 44. If you just take your mind to those days who were the chief ministers in different parts of this country, starting from Gavind Balla Pant of UP, or Ravi Shankar Shukla of Madhya Pradesh, then known as Madhya Pradesh, Central Province and Behar, Chief Minister Behar, Sri Krishna Sinha, or Dr. B.C. Roy of West Bengal. All of them were stalwarts in the freedom struggle of this country and were also elderly statesmen in age. In that context, to assume the responsibility of running a state at the age of 44 speaks itself the merit of this great leader. Sri Anumantaya led this state at a very crucial juncture when we became independent. Even the integration of the country did not take place fully. Country was partitioned, pain and agony of partition was still prevalent. There was need to provide succor. More than 200 years, colonial rule and exploitation left the economy in almost shambles. In the first 50 years, from 1900 to 1950, when we began our five-year plan in 1951, the average annual GDP growth of India was less than 1%. That speaks of the state of economy in which we became independent. Administratively, the country was divided into clear two distinct systems of administration. 60% of the country belonged to British India provinces, which we have renamed after constitution as states. At the time of independence, they were known as provinces. Whole of South, there are only two provinces. Bombay Presidency, Madras Presidency, no Karnataka, no Kerala, no Andhra, no Tamil Nadu. Only two geographical entities, 
Mumbai Presidency, Bombay Presidency, uh, Bombay Presidency, Madras Presidency. The task of the leaders at that point of time was to integrate. Thanks to the farsightedness of our leaders, like Sri Hanumantaya and many others, in the shortest possible time, without any suffering or dislocation in the lives of the common people, the integration of the states took place. Formation of the states took place in less than 10 years of our independence on the basis of distinct linguistic and cultural and ethnic identity. Developmental planning began. The objective of independence was just not the replacement of rulers. Objective of independence was much higher. In 1930, when Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru was presiding over the Lahore Congress. He was asked, what is your concept of freedom? When you have coined the word full freedom, what do you mean by full freedom? In his poetic language, Pandiji described by freedom I mean Freedom from political slavery, freedom from economic bondage, freedom from cultural stagnation. At the midnight of 14th and 15th August 1947, we had freedom from political bondage, from political slavery, but freedom from economic bondage Freedom from cultural stagnation could not be achieved by the stroke of midnight on 14th, 15th August of 1947. We had to steer the country to achieve those objectives. When as first chief minister of Arstwell Mysore State, Sri Hanumantaya conceptualized and laid the foundation of this magnificent building. It is not merely to demonstrate the architectural beauty or the magnificence of the seat of governance. It symbolized the aspiration of the newly liberated people what we want to achieve. We cannot compromise short of with the best. This Bilhan Saud speaks of that aspiration, not only the people of the state of Karnataka or Mysore, but it symbolizes the aspirations of the newly awakened, newly liberated people of India. I had the privilege not working as a colleague of him because I was too junior. But at that time I was in parliament when he was railway minister. After that, in connection with certain political activities in 1979, when I was from organizational Side looking after the state along with my other colleagues like Virappa Moili and many others. I was advised by Indiraji to have consultation and take advice from this great statesman. Several times I had the privilege of having interaction with him and every time I came out, he retired from active politics. He was not running after any office. 
He was not hankering to be somebody. He engaged himself in studies. But every time I came out after having interaction with him, my mind was quite clear that what are the approaches we should have. They had the vision. Vision of India, free from hunger, free from obscure entity, free from fragmentation, free from all sorts of mediocrity. And India vibrant, looking ahead, taking its rightful place in the Committee of Nations. To my mind, the best homage to this great personality would be to work tirelessly to achieve that objective. Just few days before Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru expired, he wrote on a slip pad a few lines from the poet Robert Frost. Woods are lovely, dark and deep, miles to go before I sleep. He clearly indicated miles to go. Indian people will have to go miles to achieve that objective. We are on the path. We are trying to achieve that objective. But for that, we require development, action, engagement, together, not in isolation. In our federal structures, while framing the constitutions, our forefathers recognized that to have the emotional integration of a vast multitude of people, at that point of time it was 350 million. Today it is 1.25 billion, more than 125 crores. Integration of this vast multitude of people can never be accomplished by merely a legal framework or a constitutional document. That's why our constitution was not made static. It was dynamic because it will have to adjust itself, change itself, redesign itself, keeping pace with the objectives, with the approach, with the aspirations of the people of India. That's why it was described as the biggest Magna Carta of socio-economic transformation by Sir Anthony Eden, who himself was very critical of parliamentary system of government in India and wrote to Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, I wish you success in your experiment with parliamentary system in your country. But frankly speaking, I have doubt. The same Sir Anthony Eden corrected his opinion and described the Indian constitution as the greatest Magna Carta of socio-economic transformation. So this socio-economic transformation, which is the objective which was the objective of the freedom struggle, which is the objective for which the foundations were laid by great leaders like Sri Hanumantaya and many others. To achieve this objective, we shall have to work relentlessly. When I look back, when Dr. Parameshwar was speaking, he was referring to if I understood correctly, most of the time he was speaking in Canada. But what little bit he spoke in English, I understood. That as chairman of the Administrative Reforms Commission, 
श्री हनुमंत या लेड एम्फेसिस ऑन अकाउंटेबिलिटी ऑन रेस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी अकाउंटेबिलिटी नॉट मियरली टू द लेजिस्लेचर दैट इज आवर सिस्टम मिनिस्टर्स आर रेस्पॉन्सिबल टू द लेजिस्लेचर एंड थ्रू लेजिस्लेचर टू द पीपल but more transparent accountability should be introduced institutions like lokpal lokayog for which we are engaged in framing the legislations were contemplated in the administrative reforms commission report of sri hanumantai should that accountability we can give we can achieve if the fine balance which exists between center and state it is not static it is dynamic new issues come new problems come there was a time when i look at the first finance commission's recommendation which was set up immediately after the establishment of the constitution for the distribution of resources between the states and center and when i compare it with the 13th finance commission's reports what in all must change i find not merely in terms of volume of transactions volume of transactions will take automatically the first indian budget first budget of independent india in 1947 was just a few hundred crores of rupees not even thousand defense budget was even the word defense was not used it was called military expenses expenditure was divided between two categories civil expenditure military expenditure civil expenditure was 202 crores of rupees military expenditure was 100 91 crore rupees total 293 crores of rupees and the taxation was 116 crores of income tax 50 crores of customs duty 166 balance deficit financing today the last budget which i presented expenditure volume is 15 lakh crores of rupees precisely 14 lakh 96000 crores of rupees so i am not talking of the figure i am talking of the content i am talking of the dimension today the specific problems of the states today the special area problem of the states special backward region of the states special problems of the states in respect of the indebtedness and simultaneously transfer of resources from the federal federal government to the state government and from state government to the local bodies are also within the purview of the finance commission